Well, welcome back. It is August 19th, 2020, beautiful Wednesday evening, 6.30 p.m., and we are glad that you're checking into Harris Chapel Church in Nazarene. My name is Dan Kaufman, and I serve as the Director for Discipleship and Assimilation here at the church, and I am just so thankful that uh, I get to share each week with you some of the different things that God has laid on my heart uh, or some things that I'm finding in my personal studies. And so last week I had shared with you that we're going to be in the book of Matthew for the next several studies. And we've been in the book of Matthew for the last two as well. And uh, we'll do a quick recap for you here in a moment. But if you have your Bibles, we're in Matthew chapter 14 tonight. So we're skipping about 10 chapters from where we left off last week. But I want to I want to share with you uh, this idea and you're going to see how it kind of plays out throughout tonight. But has there ever been a time in your life where you've had a coach or a teacher or a trainer or a mentor or a parent or whoever, fill in the blank there, where they have taught you, um, showed you the example, uh, led you in a way uh, to do something, and then that time comes to do that thing, and you're like, oh, you know what, how about you do it again this time, because I, I'm not sure what to do here, right? And uh, I think we've all, that's a, a, a example that we can all relate to. Uh, if you have one, please drop it in the comments because I would love to engage with you and, and, and learn from you and hear about what you learned. I've got a funny example. Uh, so if you know me, you know that uh, I love all things outdoors. It's just who I am, just a part of me. And I'm just thankful that God put that in me. But uh, I've been around bass boats my whole life. And several years ago, I bought a bass boat and uh I was, there was an issue with the trailer. I couldn't get the trailer to back up uh, the way I wanted. Something wasn't engaging right, so it would lock my brakes up. And I went to all these mechanics. And as I'm going about trying to fix it myself, YouTube it, go into these mechanics, uh, there's this thing in the back of my head just saying, hey, go ask your dad, right? And I let my pride get in the way. And I'm like, I'm not asking dad. I'm not doing that, right? And so it keeps going back. Go ask your dad. He probably knows. Well, X amount of dollars later and all of this stress later, I'm finally like, all right, dad, I need some help. Could you look at this? So dad comes out. And, and if you know my father, you know, typical, typical dad fashion, he comes out and he goes, uh, oh, I can fix this. Runs into his barn, grabs this little bolt, 50 cent bolt, probably puts it in there, fixes it first try, just like that. And he said, you know, I, I talked to you about this before. I'd showed you this before. Why didn't you fix it? I'm like, uh, or why didn't you remember it? He said something like that. I can't remember, but I was like, oh man, should have went to dad in the first place, right? Dad had the answer there. I should have went to him and uh, would have saved a little bit of hardship. Well, we're going to talk about something very similar like that tonight, where there has been teachings and examples and everything where Jesus is equipping his disciples to do something, where he's equipping them, but they still have to go back to Jesus for the answer. So we're going to be in Matthew chapter 14 this week and next week. And if you can't catch my drift, this first miracle that we're going to talk about tonight is feeding the 5,000. And I am incredibly excited about this one because God has just shown me uh, some things that I hadn't considered before. So I want to share these with you, but let's do a quick recap from the last uh, couple weeks, because I think it, again, it kind of lays the foundation for these times that we're going to be in Matthew. And so if you remember, and if you haven't watched the last couple of weeks, I would encourage you to go back and check them out because uh, it really lays out the context for the rest of this. But we started in Matthew chapter four, and we talked about when Jesus first started preaching. He picked up right where John the Baptist left off when John was arrested, and he was preaching this new message. And the way that he was preaching, it was new in itself. So Jesus is coming. He is presenting with a new type of authority that people aren't, aren't familiar with. And he's presenting a new message that people aren't familiar with. He's changing everything around him right there when he starts his ministry, when he starts preaching. And so that's where, that's where I want to start us here. And then as we continue on tonight, I want you to be thinking about this. Jesus' Jesus's disciples are learning from, they're being discipled, and they are obeying Jesus. And it all starts right there in Matthew chapter 4 where he calls those disciples. And this is incredibly applicable to our lives today. So like I said, we're going to be talking about the miracle of feeding the 5,000. And if you're familiar with chapter 14, Matthew chapter 14, it starts off pretty brutal. Not going to lie to you. It starts off kind of like, whoa, where is this chapter going? It starts off with Herod beheading John the Baptist and uh, talks about all those reasons of why he did it and uh, the fear that Herod had and, and why he did it. But the last verse in that particular passage in chapter 14 is really important before you hop into this next passage in Matthew chapter 14 as well. And I want to read that for you real quick. And I'm reading out of the NIV translation tonight. And so this is verse 12 of Matthew chapter 14. 
John's disciples came and took his body and buried it after he was beheaded. Then they went and told Jesus. Then they went and told Jesus. And so I did a couple, uh, a quick research here. And when you look at the, the other gospels, that part's not in there. That part where they said, then they went and told Jesus. That's, that's Matthew specific here. But when you look at Mark and Luke, uh, and the references are there on your slide. When you look at Mark and Luke, starting at the, the miracle of feeding the 5,000, it talks about the disciples coming and reporting all that they had done to Jesus. So Jesus is receiving all kinds of reports at this time right now. So let's 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 think about what Jesus just heard. Jesus just heard that John the Baptist had been beheaded. John the Baptist was preaching the same message that Jesus was re preaching. Repent, the kingdom of heaven is near, or depending on which translation you have, change your life, God's kingdom is here. They're preaching the same message. It gets John arrested and later beheaded. And if you know the relationship between John and Jesus, you know they're pretty tight. They're tight in a way that a lot of us can't relate to. You know, uh, it go all the way back to when they were in their mother's womb, they had a connection. You know, John was the one who baptized Jesus. You go back, they are close, and they're preaching the same message here. So Jesus gets this information. John's disciples tell Jesus. They told Jesus. When I read that, I think of several different things. One, I think that Jesus probably knew what was about to happen. I think Jesus probably knew that John the Baptist was going to be killed in prison for the message that he was presenting. But I see that John's disciples knew who Jesus was at this point. So they wanted to bring their fears. They wanted to bring their, their sorrows, their grief, and everything to the feet of Jesus. They wanted to bring it to Jesus. And I see that Jesus received it. Jesus received those things that they were bringing to him. But also, let's remember here, Jesus is fully man, at, fully man at this time and fully God. So Jesus is probably hurting that John the Baptist, who he has his connection with, has been killed. Hop down to verses 13 and 14 because this is really, really key. So jo Jesus has heard this, this awful news, but he's also, if you look at the other, the other gospels, he's also receiving the reports of the disciples and everything that they're doing. Because if you hop from where we ended at Matthew chapter 4 all the way up to this point, those other 10 chapters, Jesus was doing all these teachings, all these parables. He was sending out the disciples. He was giving them the authority. They were healing people, driving out demons, you name it. They were doing it. They were active in ministry doing it which is also important for what we're about to talk about here in a minute. But verses 13 and 14, when Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had, on, he had compassion on them and he healed their sick. He had compassion on them and healed their sick. So like I just said, Jesus and the disciples have been doing all these teachings. They've been doing all this work. They're probably pretty exhausted at this time. They're probably pretty tired at this time. Then throw on the news that Jesus' friend, John, has been killed for the exact same message. And, you know, there's different reasons why people think that Jesus may have withdrew. Maybe he was he was wanting to, to grieve for John. Maybe he withdrew because he was trying to, to catch, uh, catch some time to prepare himself because he knew that Herod would likely want to do the same thing to him because he was preaching the same message. Whatever reason, Jesus withdrew to be in prayer, and I believe to prep the disciples for, for further ministry because he knew that this crowd was going to come. He knew this multitude was going to come. And what does he do? Even amidst his grief, even amidst his tired self and, and everything that he's been doing, he had compassion on them and he healed their sick. He had compassion on them and healed their sick. What a teaching lesson that is for us when we are tired and we are exhausted in life. Jesus gives us the example right here to put others first, to put others first. Because I can guarantee you Jesus was tired at this point. I can guarantee you Jesus was sad at this point. But yet, he had compassion, and he healed their sick. And remember what I just talked about a minute ago in, in a couple chapters before. Jesus had given all this authority to the disciples to do the exact same stuff that he was doing. So when we look at what the disciples did in the other Gospels, when they came and they reported all that they had been doing to Jesus, and we look at what John's disciples brought to Jesus, there's a whole bunch of reporting going on to Jesus. A whole bunch of people bringing information to Jesus, whether it's their praises from what they've been doing, Jesus' disciples and their testimonies, whether it's their fears and, and sorrows, John's disciples bring that information. We are to bring all of that to the foot of Jesus. Our praises, our worship, our fears, our doubts, all of that we are to bring to Jesus. We are to report to Jesus. That is, that is key right here, and if, and, if you're, if, and if you're not looking for it, you, you might miss it. 
that John's disciples are reporting to Jesus, that Jesus' disciples are reporting to Jesus, and they're bringing every emotion all around them. It doesn't matter whether it was a good emotion, a bad emotion, whatever. They're bringing it to Jesus because they know that he is wanting it. They know that he is wanting it and he is listening because even right there in verses 14, right there, even though it admits everything else that's going on, he still has compassion for us. He still wants to work in our lives. He still wants to heal the sick. He still wants to move. Bring those emotions to Jesus. So let me ask you, friends, what have you or haven't you reported to Jesus lately? Good or bad? What haven't you reported to him? He's waiting to hear that report. So continue on in this miracle. And this is this is probably one of my favorite verses in all of the gospels here. And I and I and it's it's because it empowers us. It's because it's another way that Jesus is giving authority to his disciples. So let's hop down to 15 and 16. So it says, as evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place, and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. My favorite verse right here, verse 16. Jesus replied, they do not need to go away. You, you give them something to eat. You give them something to eat. I love that. I love that because here we have Jesus who's already done, you know, all these awesome, wonderful things. He's healing sick. He's the sick. He's doing all these great things. Do you not think that Jesus could have just provided the food right there? I mean, realistically, Jesus could have just provided the food right there. But then you have the disciples saying, coming here and saying, hey, we got to send them away. We got to send them away because we don't have food for them. But Jesus, still in control, still still capable of providing right there, says, you know what? I want you to give them something to eat. Remember the example we started with at the beginning where I said, you know, who has been training you and equipping you and, and giving you examples to do whatever. And then that time comes and you're like, oh, I'd still really rather have you do it. Well, this is that example, right? The disciples have been doing all these things. Remember, they've reported back to Jesus all the things they're doing, but yet here comes this thing that they're seeing this mountain ahead of them that they're like, I don't know what to do here. And they're saying, we we, we got to wave the flag. We got to send them away. But Jesus is saying, no, 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 no. I've been training you. I've been equipping you. I've been preparing you for this. Now you give them something to eat. Jesus provides that opportunity, that opportunity to bring his people his disciples, into his mission. Again, he could have done it on his own, but he gives them the opportunity to respond to his mission. And this is another another awesome part of this chapter uh, in verses 17 and 18, because the disciples do respond. They do respond. A lot of times when, when I read this, and I, and I reread this multiple times, because when I read it, my first thought is like, man, the disciples are being so snarky here. They're being so snippy with Jesus. They've seen all these things that they're that he's done, but they're still saying, well, what do you want us to do? We're going to have to send them away, right? And and that's how I initially read it. But when you hop down to verse 17 and 18, you see that the disciples respond in such an obedient way, in such a faithful way. In verse 17 and 18, the disciples, we have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. So again, the word only is there. So they're still saying, what are you going to do? We only have this, right? Verse 18, this is Jesus. Bring them here to me, he said. Bring them here to me. What an act of obedience from the disciples. What an act of faith from the disciples. Because again, they said, this is all we have. We're not sure what to do. But Jesus says, bring it here to me. And the disciples bring it to them. Very easily, they could have said again, hey, I don't know what to do here. I, I don't know how we're going to make this happen. What do you want us to do? But they, they bring it to them. They're trusting in Jesus. They're obeying Jesus. They remember the examples of all the things that he has done. They remember the training and the prep and everything that Jesus has done, and they're obeying Jesus. They're answering that call. Jesus is calling them to step up in this, this way, to be a part of his mission, to come in and says, and they're saying, you know what? I'm going to do it. <sighs> it's just so crazy. It may work. Remember that little bold I told you about with my dad, that he had, that he had the answer that I should have went to in the first place? Well, Jesus had the answer. Jesus had the answer and they knew that. And in that faithful obedience, they respond in such a way that they say, you know what? I think this is crazy enough. You have the answer, Jesus. You are the answer. Here, let me turn this, see if I can get you out of the sun a little bit. Sorry. You have the answer, Jesus. You have that little bolt that's going to fix this. Even though I look at this and I say, we only have this. I know that you are the answer that can make this possible. You know, when you look at verses 12, in 18, there's quite a few similarities. 
Verses 12 says, John's disciples came and took his body and buried it, and they went and told Jesus. Verse 18 says, bring them here to me. Bring them here to me. So verses 12 and 18, they've got all these similarities and all these things that are going on because what does Jesus say? He says, bring them here to me. And when we end at verse 12, we see that the John's disciples were bringing the news to Jesus, bringing them to Jesus. So if we hop back a slide, if it'll let me, it may not. I said that there's similarities between verse 12 and verse 18. Well, that is bringing all of these emotions, all of these things that Jesus is doing in our lives to him. The, the, to to him, to bring our worship, to bring our praise, to bring our sorrows, to bring our fears, to bring our doubts, to bring everything that we experience here on earth to the feet of Jesus. Our grief, our, our, our joys, whatever it is, we are to bring it to Jesus. Friends, I'm going to ask you again, what have you or haven't you reported to Jesus? Because just like that little bolt, Jesus is the answer that makes that possible. Jesus is the answer that overcomes that because even admits everything else that's going on, Jesus still had compassion on them. Don't you think that Jesus is going to answer in the same way to us? Verse 20, uh, and this gets really, really interesting. Uh, I'll just I'll just hop down to verse 20. Actually, I'll, I'll read the rest from there. So starting at verse 18, it says, Bring them here to me, he said, and he directed the people to sit down on the grass, taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven. He gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied. And this is this is my one of my favorite parts here. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. Verse 20. They picked up 12. I want to challenge you tonight because remember, I just keep trying to get you out of the sun here. I don't, I don't know which way to go. Well, not that way. Maybe that way. That'll work, right? Uh, I, I keep wanting to challenge you here. Remember that we're learning from, we're, we're obeying and we're being discipled from Jesus just as the disciples were here. So remember the disciples came to Jesus and said, this is only what we have. And Jesus responds, you give them something to eat. Don't send them away. You give them something to eat. And they're like, hey, this is only what we have. What are, what are we supposed to do with this? Well, at the end of that, Jesus, there's 12 baskets left over, 12 baskets. Well, how many disciples are there, friends? There's 12 disciples. So each disciple, in my mind, I read this as each disciple is picking up a basket, and they are reminded that God provides that God provides. Remember, this is all tying together. They're bringing everything that they have to Jesus. They're trusting in Jesus. They're being obey. They're obeying Jesus. They're being faithful. And they're saying, ah, even though this, this doesn't seem possible, I'm trusting in you. Well, Jesus gives them a reminder as they each pick up their own basket that he is the answer, that he is the answer. You know, as you read on, that could be, that, there's a lot of spiritual impact there. That could be that, uh, you know, Jesus provides for the 12 tribes of Judah all the way back back in uh, a long time ago, or this could be that Jesus is just reminding his people and the 12 disciples here that he is the answer. 12 baskets left over, 12 people picking them up. Pretty interesting. So let me challenge you. What if the miracle that took place in feeding the 5,000 wasn't for the crowd sitting there? What if that food that, that Jesus provided through the fish and the bread, it wasn't just to feed, physically feed those people? Great miracle. Absolutely. Yeah powerful but what if it was more of a spiritual teaching and an example for the for jesus's disciples for god's people that he is the answer that no matter what is going on that we are to bring these things to him and that we are to trust him that he is the answer that he can provide so when i read this and i look back through it i don't see this as just an, just as a, a physical miracle to physically feed all of these people i see this as a spiritual example and a spiritual miracle where he's saying, you know what? I'm the answer and I will provide and I will provide compassion no matter what's going on. So up till this point, the disciples had heard the teachings of Jesus. Remember, they reported back all that they were doing. And they, and if you go through the, the, when we'll hop back into the beginning parts of Matthew again, but you go back all those parable teachings and all those healings and how Jesus was just equipping them to show them what is possible in his name. You know, he's preparing them even further for when he gives the gift or when the gift of the Holy Spirit comes, when he ascends back to heaven and the Holy Spirit comes down and, and empowers his people. He is equipping them. He is training them to give them the example. Friends, I want to encourage you that the work is still the same, that even though the world's a little different right now, God is still calling people to his mission. He still views the mission the same, and he is still providing an opportunity for you 
for you to go out and to make disciples, to, to do wonders in his name, in Jesus' holy name. And each week, friends, uh, we talk about if you don't have this relationship with Jesus, this personal relationship. I'm not talking about just this knowledge of, of these scriptures that we're talking about, but I'm talking about a one-on-one, -on -one, real, intimate relationship with this Jesus, with this person. Tonight's the night. Tonight's the night to make it happen and say, you know what? I, I know I'm a sinner. I know something's not clicking in my life, and I want I want this Jesus to move in my life. Well, tonight's the night. Let's invite the Holy Spirit into your life. And so if you're ready to take that leap, please read these words with me. And if you are a Christian and you're saying, you know what? I've been telling, I've been telling God I only have this, and I'm missing on some opportunities that God's calling me to be a part of his mission. Well, it's okay to read these words too and say, you know what? I'm ready to respond. I'm ready to respond, God. So read these words with me. Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. And I ask for your forgiveness for my sins. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I turn from my old life and invite you to come into my life and to be the Lord of my life. I want to trust and follow you as my Savior. And Jesus, right now, as I do each week, I just pray for Christians. I pray that they're bold in their faith, that they're confident in their faith, that they're willing to step out and respond in obedience when you say you give them something to eat. When you call us to be a part of your mission, when you call us to be out in our communities, when you call us to be your light, to be your salt, Jesus, I pray that you make them bold and you make them confident in that truth. Jesus, that's my prayer for me. Make me bold, make me confident in that truth as you're telling me to give them something to eat. Thank you for your word, Jesus. Thank you for everybody that's out here watching online on YouTube and Facebook, Lord. And thank you for this opportunity to respond to your call in a new way. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Well, friends, as always, I am so thankful to share with you. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 14, uh, right where we left off right there. So we're going to be talking about Jesus walking on water next week. And I am sorry about this, son. I'm, I'm trying to get it right here. It'll be better next week, I promise. All right. So you guys have a great week praying for you. If you have any prayer requests, please feel free to message us at Harris Chapel here on Facebook, whatever. But also drop an example there in the comments about uh, where you learned a lesson from a, a mentor, coach, teacher, parent, whatever. We'd love to engage with you that way. See you guys next Wednesday.